Networks. You're listening to A Deeper Dive, a part of the Winsight Podcast Network. How can a small restaurant operator think about marketing? Hello, this is Jonathan Mays, Editor-in-Chief of Restaurant Business. And in this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, I speak with Chip Close, the host of the Restaurant Strategy Podcast, to talk about restaurant marketing. Chip coaches restaurant operators on marketing and recently wrote a book called The Restaurant Marketing Mindset. Most restaurant operators don't really start a restaurant because they love TikTok or enjoy marketing, but that does not make that function any less important. Chip and I discuss this, and he talks about how operators can get into a marketing mindset even before they open their doors. He talks about the best way to get into that mindset and how restaurant operators should think. We also talk about social media quite a bit and how to effectively leverage that medium to keep pace with the big guys. But perhaps the best marketing is in your own four walls, and we definitely talk about that as well. It was a fascinating conversation on an important element in the restaurant business, so please have a listen. Chip, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Cool. Well, why don't you start off by uh, telling us who you are, what you do? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Chip Close. Uh, I am a restaurant coach. I'm the host of the Restaurant Strategy Podcast. Uh, Some people might be familiar with that. Uh, I've been in the industry, I don't know, 23, 24 years at this point. Uh, Built up a ton of operational experience, got really into marketing, decided to go back to school, Uh, got my MBA in food marketing. And over the last eight years or so, I've been working first as a consultant, um, working with restaurant owners uh, sort of all over the New York City area, which is where I'm based in. Uh, and then really over the pandemic, my business shifted, went from consulting to coaching because when I couldn't go in restaurants anymore, when I couldn't leave my house anymore uh, due to the pandemic, uh, my clients still needed help. So I just helped them via Zoom and uh, phone call and through the podcast and sort of the serendipity of the uh, the pandemic, uh, my client base grew and I started working with clients all over the world. Now I'm a, now I'm a published author. Uh, author. Uh, the Restaurant Marketing Mindset is uh, the next little thing I get to add to my resume. It's a book I've worked on really since the pandemic and I uh, get, to, get to get that out into the world as well. So there, there's a lot I do, but it's all revolving around the restaurant industry. Now you typically work with what type of uh, uh, restaurants do you work with? Yeah, I always say uh, the average uh, client we work with, it's an independent operator, one to four units, one million to four million uh, per unit, let's say. So that's really the that's really the backbone of the restaurant industry in this country, right? The average restaurant makes about $1.5 million a year. That's mm-hmm. that's sort of who we work with. And I think they're just big enough that, they, uh, that they're, they're doing something right they're, and they need some help and, and they're not big enough to be able to afford a big fancy marketing agency, a big fancy uh, accounting firm, you know, a PR company, all of that. So I think they come to us to sort of get the systems and, and put some structure into place. So, you know, I would suspect I might be wrong and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> most people in the restaurant business do not go into the restaurant business because they uh, are good at marketing or want to do marketing. They mostly just like food, like cooking it, like serving it to people and enjoy the industry and, um, and, and uh, want to do that. So talk a little bit about um, how, if I'm, uh, you know, I have my, you know, two unit concept, you know, I just opened my second unit. Yep. How, do I get into the mindset of marketing my business? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll go back and say there's a lot of different hats that restaurant owners have to wear, especially independent uh, owners and operators. Uh, they've got to be HR. They've got to be accounting. They've got to be accounts payable. They've got to be marketing. So uh, this is not foreign to them. They're, uh, I think most restaurant owners sort of learn a lot about a bunch, or learn a little about a lot of different departments. And unfortunately, I think marketing sort of falls by the wayside, right? You, you do this in the book. I talk about it. Uh, there's this field of dreams effect, right? If you build it, they will come. Well, not necessarily, especially not now, because our markets are so saturated. Even if you live in a smaller rural area, there's still a lot of great places. So no matter what market you're in, there's a lot of great choices and people go to the places they know, like, and trust. So when we talk about marketing, I, I think one of the things that they uh, that most uh, owners just skip right over is this foundational piece, right? I, I always ask people about their marketing and they give me one of two answers. Number one, they start telling me about how many times they post to social media each week. 
<laughs> or number two, they say, well, we don't really do marketing. We're not some, you know, we're not McDonald's. We're not, we're not uh, Outback. We, we can't afford to do marketing. And, and neither of those are, are right, right? If you sell things to other human beings, you have to market. You have to figure out who would like what you have, right? So to answer your question, how do you get started with marketing? You've got these two units. I think you do this foundational work, and it's, it's sort of like the beginning of the book. It's something that I've talked about with my clients. I've talked about on the podcast for a long time. It's this framework that I've developed called the ABCDs of marketing, right? ABCD stands for audience, brand, competition, and differentiation. And really, it's a way to get owners and operators to think about who their audience is, right? Like who their product is for. I always say there's two ways to market. Right? Either you come up with a product and then go try to find customers, which PS is how we spend most of our time. And then the opposite, which is the best companies in the world, do it in reverse. They look out to the market. They look for a group of people who need something. And then they just fill that need. And I think we can all be much more successful as an industry if we work in reverse order. Instead of just building the thing we want to build and then go try to talk people into it, go out and figure out what people want and then build that. And so that's the foundational work. That's the, that's the heart of marketing, which is to find a market, meaning find people who need to be served. Then create a solution to their problem, right? Solve a problem that you're uniquely qualified to solve. Competition, right? It's about figuring out who's trying to solve the same problem you are. And differentiation is really this idea of how do you position yourself in the market? Let's assume if you're entering the market that there are other options in the market, right? You will not be the only restaurant. You will not be the only sushi restaurant. You will not be the only steakhouse. So if you come to market, you need to convince people why they should come to your restaurant as opposed to the one they already know, right? So we're going to open a steakhouse in town, but why should I come to your steakhouse as opposed to the one down the street that I've been going to for the last 10 years? All restaurant owners, whether we realize it or not, have to supply an answer to that. And this is the foundational work that I think most independent operators skip right over and they start talking about social media or their website or how many times they email their list or on and on. And all those things are important, but you can't begin to do that until you have this foundational work. So that's where I would begin. Understand how you fit in the market, how you, uh, what problem you solve, and how you solve it better than anyone else that's available. Meaning, why should people come to you as opposed to any of the options out there? Yeah. So, but, but you think that it's 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 smart to think about marketing before you even open the restaurant? That's a great question, right? I mean, do you mm -hmm. come up with a concept and then go try and find a space for the concept, or do you find a great space and then say, well, what does this what does this neighborhood need? There's no right or wrong answer. I think too many people do the former. I got a great idea for a concept, and they just go look at spaces that would be perfect for that concept. And I'm guessing, I would bet, because I've seen this happen enough, they pass over some really great spots that could easily house a different kind of concept because they got blinders on. And I wish we just took those blinders off a little bit. I'm not saying one way is better than the other, but I think working those in tandem, you can come up with a concept and then go try and find a space. But when you find a really great space where the rent is good, the, the, the traffic is good, all of that, you've got to be willing, able to stop and say, well, wait a minute. So the, the original concept, that wouldn't work here. But let's figure <laughs> out something that would work here because, man, this thing just fell in our lap. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's what we need to get better of doing. And we're sort of seeing that proven out over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I always – one of the earliest lesson or lessons I ever remember in business, long before I think he even became a journalist, was – if you're opening, and it was with the restaurant business, actually, um, and it was, if you're opening a restaurant in a closed restaurant or in, and, and a rest, that rest, you know, and, and maybe that site had been, you know, had held other different restaurant concepts yeah. in there. Maybe the issue isn't the concept, but the location. Why on yeah. God's yeah. green earth would you not try to find the answer to that question? Mm -hmm. What happened to the previous restaurant? Mm -hmm. So many places, so many owners don't stop to run that answer down. And you have to. You have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so um, one of the, the things that you brought up is like, is that their, their thought, it, one of the, the responses that they give you, which made me kind of chuckle was, was, um, uh, you know, they, they post several social media, they post to their social media all the time. Yep. 
you know, my, my, my thought is the potential with social today is that it can possibly level the playing field. Now, it does help if you're, you've got a giant marketing budget and you can do a lot of uh, demographic work and you can hire people that um, come up with these really awesome marketing campaigns. But social media has potential, at least, to uh, you know give you a voice with a broader audience than you'd ever been able to expect in the past. You know, in the old days, you know, you had to get on television or you had to pay for news, you know, fancy newspaper ads or billboards. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that. I'm going to hook right mm -hmm. into that in just a second. So how, you know, what's talk about the strategies that companies can use, small businesses can use yeah. to leverage social media um, effectively. Isn't it? It's, it's so, um, it's so sweet and sticky, right? We can't avoid, we can't not talk about social media. It's one of the last things that I ever talk about because I just don't think it's that important. Now, really, I do think it's important. Oh, nice. I do think it's important. It's just not more important than a lot of other things that a lot of times, here's a perfect example, right? We spend all our time saying, I need butts and seats. I need butts and seats. Okay. Social media is the way to get that. On average, an organic post is seen by about 3% of your followers. So if you've got 1,000 followers, people following your, your, your profile on Instagram, only about 30 of them are seeing it. And there's no guarantee that they're even in your market. They could be anywhere around the world. So while I think it's great to have a lot of followers, you don't know if these are followers who could be customers. And I think this is one of the real disservices we've done to ourselves. We thought, oh, I got all these followers. They could eventually become customers. We don't know that. Geography plays a big role. You know, maybe people follow because they don't have the money to go to these restaurants, right? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers follow places like Alinea or Jean George or, or, you know, Noma. They will never go to Noma because they can't get to Copenhagen and they can't afford to dine at Copenhagen, but they sort of appease that by following them and, and, and seeing what Rene Redzepi is doing. So when we talk about social media, we got to be really clear with what it is. Social media is not a social platform. They're not places for us to go and connect with people. That, that was sort of the great lie that was told. It is simply what's next. It is where the eyeballs are, where attention is. The attention was on newspapers. The attention was on radio. The attention was on TV. Now the attention is on our computer screens. And social media is very addictive. We know that. And that's where eyeballs are. So what people like Mark Zuckerberg have done in a good way is created the most sophisticated advertising platform ever created. Now, when I say that, I'll also say that 95% of all independent restaurants in this country are not leveraging the most powerful asset that that tool, right, Meta, let's talk about Facebook and Instagram. They're not leveraging the most valuable piece of that platform, which is the ability to target with great specificity the people that you want to target. So when we talk about social media, you tell me, oh, I post four times on Instagram. They're talking about organic posting. They're saying they take a picture, they post it, they add a caption, and they hope a lot of people see it. And a lot of people get hungry by the seeing the burger. And that's a hope and pray, spray and pray. There's no strategy to that. There's no goal attached to that. So the best way we should be using social media is as a one-two punch. Now, I said, I don't think it's that important, but it is important. It, it deserves its place. Mm -hmm. I believe the social media sites are about maintaining a presence. There's certainly a value to SEO, which is this very technical part of digital marketing, right? Search engine optimization. It's important that you have a presence there, that it's alive, that it's always being updated and refreshed and you're engaging. I believe that's true. But if we're using, it's like trying to use a you know, screwdriver to hammer in the nail. That's good for maintaining presence and for SEO and for traffic and all of that. Let's make sure that we're using it to accomplish the goal we need it to accomplish. But if we're trying to reach new people to raise awareness, we're using it for customer acquisition, then we're using the hammer to screw in the, the screw. We have to use the paid advertising tools. And you don't have to spend $10,000 a month to see a result. $5 a day, $10 a day. I always talk to my clients about a, a $15 a day basically, right? So that's about $450 a month. For under $500 a month, you can actually put together a pretty good strategy. Mm -hmm. And when you see it work, all you do is raise the budget there. We have to use those tools to try to raise awareness, to try to expand our reach, to try to drive specific actions.
And that's the other thing. Whenever we're talking about marketing, we got to stop talking about all the stuff we do. And I think we have to start talking about the things we're trying to achieve. I'm trying to raise awareness. I'm trying to build trust. I'm trying to drive redemptions, trying to drive traffic, to drive a sale. And almost all marketing now, because it's all digital, we can measure. So if we're not measuring it, if we're not utilizing the tools to do what we need them to do, and we're not measuring that, then we're sort of, we're losing out on the best, uh, on the best of both worlds. And 50 years ago, 100 years ago, they would have died for the kind of measurement that, uh, that we're able to get now. What kind of tools can they use to, to, to measure the effectiveness of, of their yeah. work? So it's, it's beginning with the end in mind. Saying, what do I want to do, right? So if we say, hey, I, uh, I hear what you're saying, Chip. I, I want to run an ad. H how do I run an ad? How do I run a social media ad, right? There are a million YouTube channels that will walk you through exactly how to start an ad. If you've never run an ad before, the internet is a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> what I do is I talk about the strategy behind it. So let's say we want to try to acquire new customers. We're specifically trying to drive new customers into the place. Well, that's a goal. So we say, I want to get more customers customer acquisition. Well, then what do I have to do that? Well, maybe I run an ad and I'm going to use a, an obvious exaggerated example of this. Maybe I'm going to run an ad and say 50% off your order. You know, first uh, 50%, you know, new, you know, uh, new diners get 50% off their first order. Click here to get it. Now, am I recommending that? Not necessarily. I'm using that as an example of something that might be sticky enough to get people to click. They click an ad, they go to a landing page. There's a form there. And it says, you know, uh, submit your email address and we'll send you the coupon for 50% off. So it matches the messaging of the ad. They put in their email address. They hit submit. It says, great. Now go check your inbox. So they go to check their inbox. We've set up an automation through MailChimp or Constant Contact or whatever email service you're using. And there it says, here's your 50% off coupon. And they open it. It's got a link to order online. And here's the promo code for it. Well, now we can measure. How many people saw our ad and clicked on it? How many people actually submitted their email address? And then how many people actually redeemed that offer? More than that, we can also track attributable sales because we can run a report in our POS system that says everybody who used, you know, 50 off 123, right? Well, that's the promo code we made up. We can run a report that says, hey, here's all the sales that were attributed to this promo code last week. So this is how much we spent in ad spend. This is our promo cost, and this is the attributable sales. And we can get to a net sale number. So we can measure it. We can say, what is actually the return on investment? Everybody always loves to talk about ROI, but they don't have the, the systems in place to actually measure it, and to be able to tell me, to be able to tell themselves actually what was the return. I want to be able to say, hey, for $450 a month, I was able to collect 250 email addresses, and that drove 40 redemptions. My promo cost was X. My ad cost was here. It drove Y number of sales. I take total sales minus my promo cost and I get my net sales. And I try to get it about 5X so that I spend 500 and I'm making about $2,500 in net revenue. Mm -hmm. If we can do that and we can optimize it, we can come up with an offer that's juicy enough to get people in, that's a customer acquisition strategy. That's how to use the platform to accomplish a very specific goal. Now, we need a plan to retain those customers. We need a plan to get them back and to get them back with greater frequency. But that's how we begin to use the tool the way I think it really should be used these days. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Oh, yeah. 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 I always felt that, the, um, that your best marketing, by the way, is, is within your own four walls. A hundred percent. So that, the, it's funny. So this book I just wrote, The Restaurant Marketing Mindset, and you started it off with the right question, right? How do you get in the right mindset? The book is, is strategic, right? That's what I believe. My podcast is called Restaurant Strategy. Tactics change all the time. I don't talk very much about tactics. That is a tactic. That will be outdated within six months. That's what's working right now. And if it's still working in that way in six months, I'll be wildly surprised. So the mm -hmm. book that I wrote is really more of a strategic approach, sort of teaching you the way to think about this stuff. And then hopefully you just keep learning and learning and listening. You go to trade shows and you read blogs and magazines and look at YouTube channels and, and you talk to other people in the industry, right? And the book is split up into four sections, right? Mm -hmm. We talk all about those ABCDs of marketing in the beginning. Then we talk about what I call internal marketing and external marketing. Internal marketing, I consider the four, uh, four walls marketing. 
You already have people coming in your door every night. Why are we spending all our time to acquire customers when we've already got customers? I think we can be better about selling them more so that they have a better experience. We can do a better job of getting them on our lists so that we can keep in touch with them, so we can continue to remarket to them. And I think we could do a better job about getting them back. Mm -hmm. They came in, they had a great time. They want to come back. I think a lot of times they're just not invited. They just don't know that they're welcome to come back. We, yeah. we, we do a really bad job, but I totally agree with you. It's, it's, a, it's a really lost art, which is why I dedicated an entire quarter of the book to it. Mm -hmm. you, it's, um, you, know, the, you know, one of the more beautiful things, though, about social media is it does enable you to engage with your customers on a one-to-one -one level. Eh. Um, and, and <laughs> you know, those people that are going to your restaurant on a regular basis and you see them interacting you with on, on social media, very, very important that you are maintaining that relationship on an ongoing basis. Totally. If they have problems, totally. acknowledge it. If they praise you, acknowledge it, things of that nature, because your, your online presence is your brand and it is something that you always have to work on on a constant basis. You know what's so funny? Is that there are all these um, all these uh, speakers and books and blogs and everything that talk about that, right? The importance of engagement on the social media platforms, and yet here here's where I would push back. And you sort of just said it. You sort of made made the point. We do that, right? We should engage on social media because somebody told us we should. Mm -hmm. And yet we've got actual people living, breathing, warm blooded in our dining room, and I think we don't make the most of those interactions. How many times, right? I was at a restaurant two nights ago. Manager came by. How's everything? How are you guys enjoying everything here? Everything's great. Good, good, good. And they walk away. That's a table touch because somebody told them that they had to do it. Or somebody's boss told them to tell them to, you know what I mean? It mm -hmm. came from way up high. Rather than taking the time when they're right there, right? I've, I've got a client of mine, uh, somebody I used to work with for years. And he said, I love, so he runs this little sandwich shop in, uh, outside of San Diego. And I mean, it's tiny. It's got five tables inside, four tables inside, maybe three outside. And there's always a line out the door. And he says, my job at the counter is always to make sure the person who walks in doesn't feel like the line's too long. Like they do. That's how I capture business. Mm -hmm. Because if I, if too many people come in, see eight people in line, they're not going to wait. I can't pay my bills anymore. I need that ninth person to get online. He said, you know what I got really good at doing? Looking for their logos like a sports logo on a hat or a university on their shirt or, or uh, some golf course or something that I could pull out. So I'd say, hey, USC, well, how, how do you think the Trojans are going to be this year, right? It's something to make conversation. And he got really good at it. And he's like, what happens is then I got eight conversations going on with the different people in line. And as they come up and they'll say, hey, so are, you, are you really a USC fan? Oh, no, yeah, my, my granddaughter goes to USC. And it starts from there. I mean, we can do better about creating more meaningful conversations, doing better table touches. And that's that four walls marketing, mm -hmm. right? Building, building relationships there so that, you know, the food is good, of course. Service is going to be good, of course. The dining room looks great. But that we make people feel good, especially in a post-pandemic world. It's sort of an effort to leave the house sometimes, you know? It's, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it it's not as obvious. It's not as... Um, it doesn't happen certainly in the way it did, you know, 2019 and, and before. So we got to make the most of it. And I think we can do better with that. Then sure. we look at social media as just an extension, as just an extension of, of that. But, but we have to be willing to do it within the four walls. Yeah. The best example to me that I can uh, uh, point out to to illustrate your point on a large scale is, is, is Chick-fil-A. And I've always felt um, that. You know, people, you know, the industry uh, not too long ago went kind of crazy over chicken sandwiches with this idea that they need to sure. rival Chick-fil-A by coming out with nice, really good sandwiches, which is good and important. Uh, I'm not going to debate that necessarily. And Chick-fil-A sandwiches are good. But Chick-fil-A's, the one of the bigger mistakes that people always make is just thinking that Chick-fil-A is a chicken sandwich chain and that its success is because it sells good chicken sandwiches. The chicken sandwich is just one element of it, but they have everything in that restaurant working fairly well. And, um, you know, when you go in, you go into the restaurant, they are treating you different than other restaurant chains typically do. 
Um, I think that's true. The line thing that you did. I mean, they are walking the line and maybe taking your order, making you think that things may are moving because it's not very fast. So, I mean, that to me is is probably as good an illustration on a big chain level anyway that I can do. You know, and at a small level, let me give you this one little example. I've I've told this on on my podcast and I've talked about it a lot to friends and family, but um, my wife and I took our son to Italy last year. And the first day we got there, you know, we're exhausted. We come in, we have dinner, we go to bed. The next day, we're doing a, a tour of the Amalfi Coast on a boat. So it's a six-hour tour up the coast. We stop at a couple cities. We come back down the coast. And on our way back, we're getting hungry. And we asked our tour guide. He said, where should we go? We want, we want a good seafood meal. Where should we go? And he says, oh, right where I'm going to drop you off. Remember where we met? There's a restaurant called Porta Marina. And we were like, yeah, I, I remember seeing it. I mean, it, it's a hole in the wall. It, it's sort of a dump. And we said, yeah, uh, we were we were looking for, I mean, we really were looking to get taken care of a little bit better. We said, yeah, okay, is there, is there anything like nicer? And he said, no, you asked for the best seafood, right? Like that's the best seafood restaurant in Sorrento. And I said, o- okay, we'll go. We get off there and, you know, right by the port, there's, you know, eight or nine restaurants all in a row as, as you typically find. And you could tell there's space at most of the restaurants and this place, Porta Marina, is jammed. We said, okay, that's got to tell you something. So we go up to the, the hostess. And we say, hi, do you have room for three? And she says, oh, okay, okay, hang on, hang on. Okay, so I have, uh, I have you two, then you two, and then four, and then three, and then you. You're my other three. Um, maybe 20 minutes. We said, okay. She's like, have a seat, relax. And there's a couple of benches right there by the boats. And okay, so we sit there. Not 90 seconds later, this woman is coming over with, I, I don't know, eight, 10 uh, wine glasses in her hand. She's shoving them in everybody's hands because all of us are waiting for a table. She says, here you go, a little something, just white wine comes from right up the mountain. You know, please enjoy, please enjoy. And I was like, man, number one, great hospitality. What do you do when you have somebody over? Hey, come on in. What can I get you to drink, right? You're, you're just starting the hospitality. So she gave us wine. Number two, wine eases all anxiety. It just <laughs> takes the edge off, right? It was okay. If there was a wait and I was anxious about the wait, I got a little bit more patience. But number three, and this is the most important part, is that this was a business tactic. She was playing defense because any of us who are on a 20-minute wait might just get hungry or when a, when a kid is grumpy or whatever, we say, well, let me go next door. Let me see if they can fit us in, right? But now we had a glass of wine in our hands. So number one, it was just good hospitality. Number two, it softened us and made us more patient. Number three, she was playing defense. And man, I didn't see anyone else doing it. And I was like, that is brilliant. Now, on the fourth turn, the fourth piece of this is that when we got a table, she sat us down. She's like, do you like the uh, white wine? Do you want to just continue with a bottle or a carafe or whatever? We said, yeah, it's really good. That's fine. Boom. She put it down. Beverage service was done. And she was up to her ears in, in customers trying to get a lot of food out, a lot of people seated. And I was just like, wow, like, there you go. Like, that's a level of engagement. Now, maybe they do that every night for every guest or whatever, but I've never been to a restaurant and had somebody just give me a glass of wine mm. in, in anywhere else I've been. It was truly hospitable and it had a business purpose to it. And I just, that's a level of hospitality. It's sort of bred into that culture, but like that was a deeper engagement that was more personal than many other um, many other connections that I have in in way better restaurants than this little hole in the wall place called Porta Marina right by the harbor in Sorrento. Right, nice. It's the little things. Little things matter. A hundred percent. Everything we do, right? And it's been said, our job is to make people feel important because guess what? They are. Their lives are important. What they do is important, right? And they're important to the success of our business. And our job is to just make them feel that way. It's easy to say, oh, you're not as rich as the next table. Oh, you're, you don't come that often. You're a tourist. And you're never going to come back. But at the end of the day, they chose you over any other place, right? In New York City, how many hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of restaurants. And people can go anywhere. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always touched. And somebody wanders in. It's like, wow, what made you come here? Hmm. Yeah, nice. It's the Restaurant Marketing Mindset, the book, and the podcast is the Restaurant Strategy Podcast. Chip, thanks for joining me this week on the podcast. This was fantastic. No, I appreciate you having me. And that should do it for this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, which was edited, as always, by Kimmy Kazmarek. 
artwork by Nico Hines. You may find this and other episodes of the podcast on our website at www.restaurantbusinessonline.com backslash article backslash deeper dash dive. You may also subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or listen to it wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jonathan Mays, your host, podcast producer, and the editor-in-chief of Restaurant Business. Thank you for listening.